Hi, this is Andrew Wolf. Um, so I had a question last night about uh, the cerebrospinal fluid. So I was just going to make a quick video about uh, cerebrospinal fluid, particularly how it's made and how it gets reabsorbed. So um, here, over here on the left uh, or the right side of the picture, you see a, uh, a picture of, uh, you know, lateral view of the brain and you can see the ventricles exposed. So you can see the, the lateral ventricle here and you can see the third uh, ventricle and the aqueduct of Sylvius here and the fourth ventricle here. Now, um, the cerebrospinal fluid is made within, um, you know, each of the ventricles there are these areas called the choroid plexus. And the choroid plexus is made up of these uh, little tufts that each tuft has a capillary running inside of it where blood is flowing and what's happening here you know it's very interesting because we talk you know we talked before about the blood brain barrier right blood brain barrier and the blood brain barrier is primarily um, held main, maintains its barrier because it has very very tight very very tight seal within its endothelial cells okay that's the main um, reason why there is a blood-brain barrier. But there is also something that's called the blood cerebral spinal fluid barrier. So blood CSF barrier. And it's a little bit different. It's not held in check the same way and different substances get through it than uh, that get through the blood-brain blood barrier. The blood CSF barrier, um, the capillaries in the blood CSF barrier, the capillaries that make up the choroid plexus, are actually fenestrated. So fenestrated comes from the Latin word fenestra, which means window. So those of you who have, um, have you know, if a doctor has asked you for a fenestrated drape before, that is a drape that has a window in it. So that's what fenestrated fenestrated means. So basically there are windows in in between the endothelial cells and actually within the endothelial cells. So um, this actually allows fluid, proteins, large molecules, electrolytes to flow freely from the blood into the extracellular space just outside of the ependymal cells that make up the choroid plexus. Then there are extremely tight junctions between the ependymal cells and the choroid junction. And it is really that tight junction that makes up the blood CSF barrier, right? So there's very loose connections. There's actually fenestra um, within the uh, endothelial cells and the capillaries but they're extremely tight junctions, so nothing can get in between the cells. Um, not even water can get in between the cells, the uh, ependymal cells and the choroid plexus. So everything, all the fluid that is made in the CSF actually has to pass through this cell. So the fluid of the CSF is actually excreted by the ependymal cells. And what's excreted, everything that's excreted is water can pass through um, through aquapores, so water goes through freely, but everything else needs to sort of pass through um, through special proteins and, pro and ion pumps. Now, of course, you would probably guess that there are, of course, plenty of sodium and potassium, sodium potassium pumps here, and that is the main way that potassium crosses through the, um, I mean that sodium passes into the CSF. And chloride passes through, um, I, I believe it's um, through a, um, a chloride bicarbonate exchange ion. Um, so basically you get the idea though that all the electrolytes that pass through, this is something, something you're, you're going to see similar, and we're going to go through this in more depth when we get to the kidney, how ion exchanges occur. Uh, but everything that gets into the cerebrospinal fluid um, is ex 
is does so by being excreted, actively excreted by the appendable cells. So the choroid plexus here, the choroid plexus, the, you know, the, the biggest choroid plexus is in the lateral ventricles, but there's, there's a choroid plexus in, in each of the ventricles. They are um, constantly excreting cerebral spinal fluid. In fact, so we have an average of 100 to 150 mLs of, of cerebral spinal fluid within um, surrounding our brain and spinal cord at any given time. And this is exchanged approximately three times a day. So our choroid plexi are making between about 400 and 500 mLs of CSF per day. So, you know, there is a significant flow, about 30 mLs per hour of, of flow from these areas. And, you know, they're sort of produced in the, in the central areas. And then they flow um, around the brain and around the spinal cord. And then they are reabsorbed in the arachnoid villi um, up at the, you know, sort of at at the superior part of, of the brain um, in the superior sagittal sinus. So the superior sagittal sinus is um, an area where there is venous blood in the sinus of the skull. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, the way that the um, cerebral spinal fluid is absorbed is anytime the CSF pressure, if the CSF pressure is greater than the pressure of the venous pressure, in the, cerebr uh, the superior sagittal sinus, then the fluid is absorbed. So it's reabsorbed completely by hydrostatic forces. Okay. Now, what's interesting to note here is all of the cerebral spinal fluid, about 30 cc's per hour, is created in this area of the ventricles. And all of it is reabsorbed up here. So what happens if there's some kind of blockage between where it's being created at 30 cc's per hour and where it's being reabsorbed? Then you end up with something like hydrocephalus. Actually, hydro hydrocephalus can be caused by three different things. It, it can be caused by obstruction, which I believe is the most common. Those of you that work in, in um, neurology um, can verify this one way or the other. Um, and then the other cause would be overproduction, which I think is probably the rarest, where there's just too much that we're producing more CSF than we can, um, than we can reabsorb. And then there would be, you know, decreased absorption. So, you know, it could be because of increased um, venous pressure in the superior sagittal sinus, or it could be because there are um, problems with uh, the, the membrane in the uh, arachnoid villi. Okay, so that's my uh, brief review of cerebrospinal fluid. I hope this was helpful, and I will talk to you soon.